Surprise, everyone. I have Brie with us this month to actually talk about the field blown cab prompt that everyone except for the Orange Wine Club is getting. So hello, Brie. Thank you for being with us. Thanks, Holly. I'm excited to be here and excited that you have our Field Blend Cab Franc, which is, uh, you know, one of the first Cab Francs from the Willamette Valley. Yeah, I know. I remember we talked about this a little bit last time, and I'm really excited for you guys to hear from someone that is not me, because it's always me, talking about these wines. <laughs> Um, so I'd love to just kind of have you start by talking about um, these grapes, because I know it's a field blend because it's different clones. Talk about how that came together and just a little bit about where you are, what you guys are doing. Um, and then we can do a little fun tasting after. Great. Yeah, so um, this is our sort of second uh, Cabernet Franc project in the Willamette Valley. And uh, both of our Cabernet Franc projects come from the Eola Springs Vineyard in the Eola Amity Hills. Um, it's farmed organically and dry grown, um, but these three clones were planted in 2016, um, just after um, we'd been making uh, wine from Old Vine Cabernet Franc, which was actually Pinot Noir that was grafted oh. over to Cabernet Franc. So yeah, we had these Pinot Noir vines on this really rocky Nakaya volcanic basalt soil. And the Pinot Noir wasn't really performing well. It wasn't setting fruit. It wasn't economical for the farmer. And so he said, okay, well, what would you suggest? And we said, uh, if you'd plant, if you'd graft over to Cabernet Franc, we would buy it from you every year. So we made three vintages of that and they got better crop. The fruit was you know, just exceptional quality. Um, it ripened every year. And uh, we then just said, okay, now that this works, will you plant some more for us? <laughs> so he was actually pretty willing to plant another two acres. So we now have four acres of Cabernet Franc from this Eola Springs site and we make two bottlings of it. So we still continue with the old vine bottling. And then because this is nice young vine fruit um, and it's three different clones. So one California heirloom clone and two Loire Valley clones. So we planted them all next to each other on sedimentary and volcanic soils. Um, and we, yeah, picked them and blended them as a, you know, fermented them as a field blend. So that's what it means by that is that it's three different clones planted right next to each other. So we can see how they ripen and see what the flavor differences are. Um, that's kind of what we geek out on. Yeah, Nick was asking about that too, because he was like, if it's just Cab Franc, what makes it a field blend? And I was like, I think it's because there's different clones in it, so. Yeah, we were taking some liberties there with, you know, the, the terminology of field blend since, I you know. Too. Like, I, I like I like co-opt co-ferment sometimes. I'm like, technically, like like when like red and white is put together, I call it co-ferment. I'm like, maybe it wasn't co-fermented, but you know what I mean. It's close, yeah. you know, like you, you're getting where I'm going with this. Exactly, exactly. So, and since we don't really have a lot of, you know, defined um, wine laws here in the US, we can kind of, you know, be creative with our terminology so that's why it's a field blend for us and you know as as the vines start to set more fruit we might actually start to isolate out the different clones and make a single bottling of the mm. different clones nice. but for now it's a field blend <laughs> and to rewind a bit um so if you could just tell us a little bit about your background i have always fangirled over brie because she's like my mw idol uh, like she's a master <laughs> of wine and she's making wine, which I would love to do someday. Um, so I'd love for you just to speak to a little bit about your background and Chad too, honestly, because Chad was also at Minimus before, I believe. So I'd love to just kind of hear how you guys got here. Yeah, sure. Um, so yes, I'm a master of wine, but I had a long career in wine before I became a master of wine. So that sort of helped me pass the MW qualification. Um, I began my real journey with wine as a sommelier, uh, working in restaurants in Vancouver, BC and in Australia. Um, I moved into some sales and some importing uh, and also um, teaching for the Wine and Spirit Education Trust, um, taught for those guys for many years and still teach diploma level classes. Um, but, you know, it was really in like 2009, 2008 that I started to fall in love with the idea of finding, um, you know, different varieties to work with and to get 
a better understanding of what's happening from vineyard to cellar. Uh, and so I started making rosés uh, in the Yarra Valley, and then um, I started doing um, what what I called the um, sort of the eternal harvest, which is um, <laughs> the endless summer, the eternal harvest. Um, so I was doing grape harvests in Australia, in the Southern Hemisphere, and then I was coming over to um, North America and also to Canada and to different parts of Europe um, to, to do vintage in different regions, regions that I just, you know, I loved. I was importing some Spanish and Portuguese wines. So I worked mm -hmm. in the Douro, I worked in Bierzo, um, I just fell in love with, you know, like that whole sort of Galician green coast, Ribera Sacra yeah. um, area. Um, and I also love Austria. So I made wine in Austria as well and played around with Blaufrankisch and Grüneveltliner. And uh, I now work with some of those varieties here in Oregon. So that's sort of, I guess, in a nutshell, <laughs> how I how I got into how I got into all of this. I moved to Oregon um, permanently in 2017 and uh, hung up my harvest boots, my eternal harvest boots. <laughs> um, and that was when uh, Chad and I decided to um, stop doing a sort of long distance relationship. Um, and he still had uh, Minimus at Craft Wine Company then and so we were I was making a, just a very small amount of my wine there while he was continuing to make Minimus and um, we were both at that point starting to further develop different vineyards um, around the Willamette Valley for alternative varieties. Um, the climate's changing here uh, we need a lot more diversity in terms of our varietal selections and also uh, what I really noticed um, coming to Oregon was that um, <laughs> When you work with a single grape variety like Pinot Noir, when that grape variety ripens all at the same time, uh, you get really, really short of labor. And in 2017 and 2018, it got vicious. You know, people were like giving more money to like, okay, we'll pay you to come over here and we'll pay you this much, you know, more per bucket. And, and I just thought, geez, this just isn't sustainable. You know, we really need to work with some growers to help them diversify um, and so that we're not all trying to bring in, you know, 200 tons of Pinot Noir in the one week, you know, it's, it's not sustainable for pickers. It's not sustainable for winery workers to process, you know, that amount of fruit in such a short time. So thus our diversity, um, you know, portfolio, I guess, you know, kind of continued to grow from there. And that's been our passion ever since. Um, and Chad left Minimus in 2019. And uh, that's when we officially started limited edition. Nice. Yeah. And I think the other thing I was just talking to Rania about this because I think she was with you. So we were chatting about this and the like multiple varietals. And I think that it makes so much sense also like because like like you said, Pinot Noir wasn't doing great there at the time. And so it's like, why would you just have all of your eggs in one basket? Plus, if you're having to pay for the extra labor. So I think that's great. And I think that the natural wine movement generally is really focusing on these things. So it's really exciting to see what you guys are doing there. And I'm really excited to try this wine with you because it's so yummy. Um, I Yay. love that it's like a young Cab Franc and I won't give that much away because I've obviously had this wine multiple times. Um, but I think that it's such a fun and interesting example of young Cab Franc. Um, so you talked a little bit about how it was made already. So I guess maybe we should just do some actual tasting now. Yeah, so um, so we make three different Cabernet Francs from um, from this vineyard. So one is a rosé sparkling pet nat, and then this is our you know young vine, juicy young, um, I guess nouveau esque style. Um, so we actually do this 100% whole cluster. So we just sort the fruit, um, put it across the conveyor belt to make sure there's not you know any damaged fruit in there. Um, and then we jump in and foot tread it for a little bit. Um, but primarily the grapes stay um, intact in ho um, whole bunches. And so um, what I really like about that is it gives this just amazing like spice and um, like Eastern sort of rainforest spice character or pine forest spice character to the wine like lots of cinnamon and yeah, yeah sandalwood is, I was taking my notes before and I was like cinnamon's in there it's so much more than like what you think of just like a whole cluster nouveau style wine because like it really does have these secondary characteristics that you don't always see I think you're probably getting that from the whole cluster versus just doing like 
uh, carbonic on the whole thing and letting it yeah, exactly. And so we were really surprised as well about how um, the wine actually aged in bottle because when we bought we bottled this, you know, uh, in October, November last year. Um, but, you know, then it was just really like raspberries and raspberry leaf and super juicy and fresh. Um, and then now it's starting to go into, yeah, some of those secondary characters like black olive and sagebrush and it's getting pretty complex, but there's still this really, you know, vibrant core of raspberry and sort of blue plum fruits that come through, which is kind yeah. of crazy for, you know, thinking that, you know, oh, Cabernet Franc doesn't grow in the Willamette Valley because it's a Pinot Noir region. You know, I mean, you look at the Loire, it's a cool climate region as well. And there's plenty of, you know, Pinot, Pinot Meunier, Pinot Noir, Pinot Denise, as well as Cabernet Franc growing. Um, and the unique thing about Oregon is that, or the Willamette Valley, is that we have a lot of like really blue skies during the growing season. And so we kind of get this like photo degradation happening of the pyrazines, that sort of bell pepper and grassy character that you can get in Loire Cab Franc that really breaks down because of our abundant sunshine here during the growing season so we get you know really ripe fruit flavors but at really low alcohols which is you know <laughs> really appeals to me as someone who yeah, likes to have a few glasses of wine every day <laughs> um so it's yeah that's I feel like that really like resonates too because like when people just consistently think like natural wine glue glue or whatever like when you're going to bring a, a bottle to your mom's house that maybe likes heftier stuff like it's really nice to have that so it's not just like feeling like you know I, I want I don't want to say carbonic fluff but for some reason that's like the term that came to my mind you know what I mean where it's just <laughs> like, like like there's not enough there there's not enough oomph for a lot of like you know uh people that are used to having conventional wine so yeah, exactly, exactly. And that's, that's, I think, really important for us is that, you know, it does resemble the grape variety, but it's completely unique to the Willamette Valley. So, you know, it's sort of got a foot in that sort of, you know, glue, glue, Loire, natural carbonic world, but also, you know, has a pretty serious, um, you know, typicity of, of cool climate Cabernet Franc as well. And I really <laughs> like this wine. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I was gonna say I just I really like this wine because you can chill it a little bit and I you know mind, it, mind you <laughs> <laughs> yeah because it doesn't have like extreme tannins because we didn't like punch down the cap or punch you know pump mm -hmm. it over a lot we just really you know were pretty hands off apart from the initial foot treading and so it's just got really gentle tannins um, so it really makes it friendly for you know a chillable chillable quaffable picnic sort of wine as well which you know I'm all about. <laughs> It's good yeah, to have a day especially drink. as it starts to get warmer. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's one one thirty here right now. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> as far as like uh, pairings go, picnic food, I think like like this, I literally had this at lunch with a BLT and it was like, like <sighs> so good. Nice. Um, like what else would you like think to put this with? Uh, I mean, charcuterie for sure. Um, but I really like it with um, like a little mozzarella salad as well with a little bit of oh. just a hint of like balsamic, you know, vinegar mm -hmm. playing in there. Um, it's pretty fun as well. Um, I had it with uh, steak tartare the other day. I had a, I had this dairy oh. cow steak tartare, nine-year-old dairy cow. Um, it was amazing. It had so much like meaty flavor, but it brought out all of these, you know, savory and fruity notes in the wine. So it was just, yeah, this really fun, you know, pairing. Um, of course, lamb for me being Australian, you've probably heard my mm. funny accent. Um, mm. I, you know, <laughs> I love Cabernet Franc and lamb. <laughs> Even though most yeah. people would say Shiraz goes with lamb, I say Cabernet Franc. <laughs> I think, yeah, especially depending on what you do with the lamb, you know, like if you make it stewy or something, then maybe I would go towards Shiraz. But if you're doing something lighter with it, like we like to put it in like um, different types of like Korean dishes or something Ooh. like that would totally trend to me more towards something like this with a slight chill, like lamb and like kimchi and this, like that could totally work. It'd be so yes. nice. With slight chill. That sounds amazing. Yeah. Korean dishes would be fantastic and yeah some spicy kimchi because yeah it's low alcohol it doesn't have extreme tannins and because you can chill it a little bit yeah now I I need to go and seek out <laughs> <laughs> seek out some of that to pair with you're gonna this. make a kimchi pancake tonight oh yum I love kimchi pancakes <laughs>
<laughs> that's yeah, perfect. That's, that's what I was thinking when we had it because we, we you sent us a couple before, so like we've literally had this one I think three or four times now. I think one time was a kimchi pancake. I have lamb downstairs and have contemplated. That's the only meat we have right now, so I was contemplating that tonight. Um, so yeah, there's just I think it's like super versatile, and what I really like about it is what we were talking about earlier too is like the idea that it does have um like the spices to it like it just opens up this whole other world of pairings that like of course you could I could just sit and drink it it's delicious but like you could definitely yeah. put it with all different kinds of other things and it's going to still play well with that yeah exactly because it's cool climate you just get all of these like more subtle spices and subtle savory notes um coming through in it instead of just being sort of a big fruit bomb that you know can be a little bit dried out or you know it's it's in neutral oak barrels so it doesn't have any oak flavor to it um and also it come you know it's made in eggs and and eggs and oak barrels um so it doesn't really have you know any perceptible flavor apart from the whole cluster and the grapes so it's just really transparent and really fresh and yeah they're just like the you know truest sense of of cabernet franc well i love it i know everyone in the uh, club's gonna love it so thank you so much for putting it in and we also have i think like four or five of your other wines that'll be on the retail store too so if y'all love this one like definitely go check out the uh pet nap version of it um, and then we have some of her whites and rosés on there as well. So thank you so much for talking with us about it. I'm so excited to have this one this month and let us know what you think of it. Thanks so much, Holly.